Ah, California, home to the Golden Gate Bridge, stunning coastlines, and $20 avocado toast. But more importantly, it's the home of an idea that ended up saving the internet. Today on The Serial Port, we'll be taking a look at a networking technology and a revolutionary device that prevented the internet from tumbling headfirst into a catastrophe. But first, as we often do, let's time travel back to 1992 and head down to San Diego. There, a group of engineers in the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, were discussing potential threats to the internet. Whoa, wait a minute. Who was using the internet in 1992? Actually, almost no one in the general public. The internet was mainly used for services like email and file transfer, and this was before the World Wide Web took off in popularity. There was no real need to connect to the internet. It was, frankly, not so interesting for most people because it was simply Telnet and FTP and some Usenet news, which you can get through UUCP. So you didn't actually have to have the internet for that. Despite this, the IETF saw how much the internet was starting to grow. And as is many times the case with growth, it can come with problems. One of the looming issues that they identified as early as 1991 was with what they termed IP address space exhaustion. In other words, running out of available IP addresses. After a meeting in 1992, they stated in RFC 1380 that if the current exponential growth rate continues unabated, the number of computers connected to the internet will eventually exceed the number of possible IP addresses. No doubt that sounds bad, but they even issued a dire warning stating that the issue is serious enough that it deserves our earliest attention. It is very important that we develop solutions to this potential problem well before we are in danger of actually running out of addresses. So this was an existential issue to the growth of the internet. But how did this happen in the first place? In the earlier days of the internet, IP addresses were allocated to the institutions that needed them by the IANA, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, and first actually by one man in particular, the legendary John Postel. And before 1994, the IP address space was divided into three main classes. Class A blocks, or nets as they were called, were by far the largest, with each block containing nearly 17 million IP addresses. Class B blocks were the next largest, and these contained around 65,000 IPs per block. And finally, Class C blocks were the most numerous at around 2 million blocks available, but contained only 256 IP addresses each. Lots of these blocks, especially Class B blocks, were being assigned at a rapid pace. And because of its 32-bit structure, IPv4 is limited to 4.3 billion unique IP addresses. And this was enough for what the internet was at first, just an experiment. But as the internet grew into a global network connecting everything on the planet, well, it wasn't quite enough. Researchers in the IETF proposed a number of solutions. The Class A and B blocks of IPs were generally way too large for most institutions, and Class C was too small. So huge numbers of IP addresses were essentially wasted by not being utilized. You know, people would naturally want to get uh, a, a network address that had, you know, plenty of room for growth. And so the, the, the space was just being utilized very poorly. One solution to this was called CIDR, or Classless Interdomain Routing. Once implemented, it made delegating IP addresses much more efficient, as it allowed variable amounts of IP address space to be assigned, rather than the defined blocks of the previous method. A group of proposals was also brought forth that advocated for changing or extending the IP address itself, originally called IPNG or IP Next Generation. This would later become what is now called IPv6. However, another solution was being formulated by this guy, Paul Francis. While working at Belcor in 1993, he wrote a paper along with his intern at the time, Tony Ng, titled, Extending the IP Internet Through Address Reuse. This was the first published work of what we now call Network Address Translation, or NAT for short. The drawing for how it works is hard to understand in today's context, but you have to remember that this predates the World Wide Web and the internet had some key differences compared to today. For starters, prior to 1994, the concept of a private versus public network wasn't as well defined. If a device on your network, like a computer or printer, needed to be on the internet, it needed a globally unique IP address. So as the number of devices on the internet grew, 
the number of available IPs would, in turn, dwindle. So Paul Francis came up with the idea of creating a sort of barrier between these private and public networks. The idea was to allow smaller networks to use a set of IP addresses that would be considered reusable and that didn't need to be globally unique, exactly like we do today with local area networks. His idea was that a device called a network address translator would sit between the smaller network, like one in an office, and the larger internet. The translator would have a handful of globally unique IP addresses, and when a device on the smaller network needed to access the internet, the translator would intercept the request and change or translate the IP from the internal one to a globally unique one. To outside hosts on the internet, it would seem like the requests were all coming from the same device, but in fact, could be originating from many different ones. And for Paul Francis, this idea didn't seem like that big of a deal at the time. I think at the time, this idea didn't seem particularly more promising than, than other ideas in my mind. I mean, it was, it was just one of, of some ideas. I, I probably would remember it better if I, if I knew what was gonna happen to it eventually. Because there were some, let's say, reservations about NAT among other IETF members. Yeah, reservations is a pretty mild word. Uh, people were quite upset about this idea. You know, the the the, the folks around the ITF were, were were adamant about not allowing this to happen. So they didn't want to standardize this. They didn't want to even write it down if, if they could avoid it, although they couldn't really avoid that. A very vocal faction of the IETF wanted to preserve the end-to-end -end principle of the internet. A key point of this principle is that connections should only be destroyed if the endpoint itself is broken, a concept called fate sharing. So the idea was that anything in the middle could go down and the system would, would root around the failures and, and, and still operate. NAT introduced a critical failure point between the endpoints. If NAT failed, then all communication would fail as well. I think this was was even a little bit religious to some to some extent. You know, the, uh, there's a bit of a litmus test that you believed in the end-to-end -end principle and you designed for it, or 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 you know, or you didn't, and 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 uh, you, you were whatever, uh, stupid or evil or something. Uh, you know, after I did that work, there's a lot of criticism. Um, uh, I was a bit of a pariah, and I, I I sort of believed that. You know, I said, yeah, okay, you're right. You know, we shouldn't be doing this. And I myself, you know, went off and, and worked on IPv6. So with NAT left to the wayside, the problem of IP addresses running out still loomed on the horizon. The following year in 1994, in Redwood City, California, John Mays, an engineer, was having great success with a consulting practice called JMA, short for John Mays and Associates. Little did he know at the time, but he was about to embark on a world-changing venture that would help shape the internet for decades to come. Mays had a very early start in consultation and system administration, starting at age 16 configuring IBM System 34 and System 38 mini computers for customers. Yes, believe it or not, these were actually considered mini in that era. He continued consulting in this way through college and eventually founded his own company called JMA. Working out of a house, Mays and his associates were helping companies implement IP networking and were getting them connected to the internet. A common problem they encountered was that many customers would be using unregistered IP addresses for their local area networks, but wanted to connect them to the internet. So they had these sometimes hundreds, sometimes thousands, literally, of workstations uh, on their network with unregistered IP addresses. This would oftentimes lead to a conflict where the IPs configured on their network would already be in use on the internet. This was a common issue during this era. So there are a lot of cases where people would have a public IP, other people would be using the same IP as a private IP, um, and this was not clean. And there were really only just about three options to get around this at the time. They could use a proxy server, which acts as a middleman between a private network and the internet. However, proxy servers were not a great solution as they simply did not scale. And in the early 1990s, you would have to have a special SOX client typically running on Windows, which would connect to the proxy server on these special ports, instructing the proxy server where to connect on the internet beyond that. And I never liked installing those because they were incredibly support and maintenance intensive. Alternatively, JMA would often set companies up with a Sun workstation as a gateway, 
combined with a Livingston Portmaster router, and this would allow other devices to simply log into the gateway for internet access. This solution worked well for the early text-based services like email and news groups, which many users could do on a single Unix workstation, but that changed completely once the World Wide Web was unleashed. The third option was to painstakingly manually reconfigure all of the existing devices to new public IP addresses assigned from an ISP. JMA would often do this for their customers over a weekend, working 24 hours a day and getting the company back up and running by Monday morning. They would all pack up and leave at five o'clock and we would get to work and we would go to every desk in every closet, finding every piece of networking equipment, every server, every printer, everything that we could find. And we had, a, of course, had a plan in advance and we would renumber all these devices by hand. And back then it was not always easy. And it was, it was very, very uh, disparate networking equipment. It was not all the same thing. So we had to know everything. And we would go through and renumber and reconfigure the whole network. And we would work 24 hours a day from Friday at five o'clock all the way through Monday morning at eight o'clock. And at the time, this worked for smaller customers, but for larger customers with thousands or even tens of thousands of devices, you need much longer than a week, more like months. The problem I faced, as with my huge customer service ethic, is that I had customers that I couldn't help. That made me very unhappy. I had to have a solution for these customers. You know, in my head, I would con continually think, well, we get a router like this, that like this, how can we arrange things? And there was nothing in the world out there at all that would do what these people needed to get them connected to the internet. But then Mays had an idea. Instead of trying to wrestle a customer's network into the same address space as the internet, what if there was a different way? I thought to myself, wow, if I can pull a packet off the network, I can change that packet and then I can change it back on the way through. And that was the, that was the moment when I thought, why don't I build something? John Mays had just independently invented network address translation just about a year after Paul Francis had developed the same idea, except his conception of NAT was tailored specifically for his customers' needs. And to Francis, this was not surprising. You know, this is the critical thing, right? Nobody's gonna spend money on a box to save the world's global address space. He figured out how to get people to buy the box to solve their own problem. And this, this had never occurred to me. So I, I was, was you know, very impressed with that. Mays then contacted his longtime friend and the best engineer he knew, Brantley Coyle. Coyle had been there from the beginning of the microprocessor and knew how to turn this idea into reality. The first decision was to figure out what hardware to use for their NAT device. Mays' first instinct was to use a Sun workstation, but Coyle offered an alternative. Thanks to him, we ended up not going with a Sun workstation because that, that would have severely limited our performance, plus increased our cost. After seeing the success of network appliances use of Commodity x86 hardware, they decided to use the same approach. They started off with a basic system using an Intel 486 processor. Coil then started to work on the software. Coil coded the new translator box as a purpose-built appliance with its own real-time executive to run the show. This was a game-changing idea according to Mays. And incredibly, the finished code package had only 7,000 lines of mostly C and a little bit of assembly. For what it was doing and what it was running on, the device was blazing fast. And by this point, Mays had relocated to what Coil described as a shed attached to an aircraft hangar at the Palo Alto airport. Coil was based out of Athens, Georgia, and during visits to California, he would often walk around the duck pond nearby to think over development issues on their new translator box. <laughs> and after reviewing how this new device would need to be implemented at customer sites, it became clear that it would also need to be a firewall. NAT was unintentionally a security feature, since by default, NAT would prevent outside traffic from the internet into a company's private IP network, creating a partitioned space between the two networks. And the firewall feature allowed them to be able to grant and deny access for different protocols, enabling control over this partition. They dubbed this part of the product adaptive security and owed to a previous company that they had both worked for and where they had met, which also included Silicon Valley alumni Reed Hastings and the inventors of the Catalyst 5000 switch. So as the translator box neared completion, they needed a name. 
They kept it simple and straightforward, and Network Translation Incorporated was born. And along with a new company name, they needed a name for the device itself. It was dubbed the PIX, or PIX, which stood for Private Internet Exchange. This was a play on the telephony term PBX, or Private Branch Exchange, as the two technologies were the same in principle, but for two different applications. And here it is, the very first Network Translation Incorporated PIX prototype. Housed in a bare-bones PC chassis, it had the look of a simple PC, but housed something much more special. And at first, it was just Maze and Coil working on the PIX. The JMA crew would work during daylight hours to pay the bills, and Maze would work into the next day as late as 3 a.m. on the PIX, sometimes sleeping in his chair just to go at it again the next day. It was incredibly hard work and ridiculously long hours. Those were weekdays. Weekends would be typically only 10 to 12 hours. So they were, they were pretty long weeks during that time. And all of that hard work eventually paid off. The first PIX was deployed in November of 1994 at a customer site as a beta test and ended up being a smashing success. From there, the first 10 units went out to customers. And the PIX was incredibly easy to configure. Customers would literally fax an IP network diagram to NTI, and Maze would instruct them where to physically connect the PICs and provide them with just five commands to configure it. That was it. From there, the PICs was up and running. And the PICs was revolutionary. This was the first commercial device with NAT capability, and NAT that was adapted for the real world to solve a pressing business need. It proved to be extremely popular. It won Data Communications Magazine's Hot Product Award in 1995. And around the same time, John was introduced to the CTO of Cisco, Ed Kozell. During the time that we were operating our company full speed ahead, several companies kind of took notice. And one of them was Cisco. And a friend of mine, Shannon Mathelier, invited me to a Christmas party at Ed Kozell's house. And... Shannon introduced me to Ed Kozell, and uh, Shannon said, oh, you know, John's doing this thing. And Ed said, well, what is it? And I explained it to him. He ignored everybody else at the party for about an hour, which is not very good for a host generally, but this was so interesting and so important to him that he sat and we talked for about an hour, just he and I, and I explained to him every everything we're working on. He was fascinated by it. So fascinated, in fact, that after a few months of waiting and negotiating, Cisco acquired NTI in November of 1995 in what turned out to be one of their more successful mergers. Cisco quickly built on the success of the NTI PIX and released their first PIX model called the Classic. And Mays wanted to make sure the success of the PIX continued. Cisco, at the time, didn't do advertising. That needed to change for the PIX. So Mays was able to convince the new CEO of Cisco, John Chambers, to invest in an advertising campaign. The NTI acquisition also heralded Cisco's entry into the security market, in which they had no presence at that time, so the product was marketed with this in mind. The PIX ended up being one of Cisco's most successful products. Cisco sustained consistent growth year over year thanks in part to the massive adoption of the PIX. Updated models were released almost yearly from 1996 to 2002, and all were x86 based, so those early decisions to use commodity hardware left a lasting impact on the entire product lineup. Building on the success of the PIX, Cisco introduced the Adaptive Security Appliance, or ASA, product line in 2005, with the word adaptive having its roots all the way back to when Maze and Coil first met. Cisco announced the end of sale for the PIX line in 2007, with the 515E being the last model produced. The success of the PIX and the introduction of NAT helped sustain the internet's incredible growth in the mid to late 90s through the 2000s. But looking back, the original inventors are surprised at the success that it had. No, I think I'm surprised every step of the way and I'm still surprised, which is great. But I was just thinking of it as solving a, an address shortage, but he was thinking of it as solving a network management problem. The idea of network address translation back in the day was a revolutionary idea that that really changed. It was a new, I hate to use the word paradigm, but it was the new paradigm for connecting disparate networks together. 
It, it really changed the architecture of the internet from a single flat address space into a two-tiered space, a private and a public space. And now NAT is everywhere. It's in all the routers we use at home, it's in our smartphones, and ironically, it's even in IPv6. These days I look back on it and I, I'm always amazed to think that every house, every business, anything that is connected to the internet, with few exceptions, anything that's connected to the internet that needs any kind of security is behind a network address translation device. And it makes me very happy to know that everybody is using this idea from a wacky guy back in Palo Alto in the day. Now that we've seen just how revolutionary the PIX was, it would only be fitting to include one in the Serial Port Museum. We now have a Cisco PIX 515E in our collection. And what better way to celebrate this device than to put it back in service? We're using our PICs to perform network address translation, a fitting tribute to the legacy of this device. While the PICs has been long surpassed by better and more advanced devices, we can't help but appreciate the huge impact it has had on the internet. And we're finally seeing the next generation IP, IPv6, finally becoming widespread. It's all thanks to NAT, the picks and the ingenuity of people like Paul Francis, John Mays, Brantley Coyle, and countless others that enabled the internet to grow as quickly as it did. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on The Serial Port.